Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Live here on Two Stroke Medium. I am Josh Hayes with Chuck Manley and Scott Moon. And today, best selling collabor collaboration authors and uh, publishers of uh, Athon Books, or owners, I guess, of Athon Books, uh, Retsy Bruno and Steve Bollier, Jamie Castle. And uh, Jamie's got a multiple personalities. Uh, we're going to be talking to both of those personalities today, but welcome everybody in the live chat uh, who decided to spend their morning with us. We had some audio issues as always when the show was getting started, so I apologize if me or anybody else sounds wonky. Uh, we tried to fix it and it's just, I think the YouTube gods are angry with us today. Corey Gillum had the first uh, comment of the day, so he gets the keystroke medium golf clap of appreciation. Thank you, Corey. Welcome to the show. Bart of today. Hello. Welcome. Uh, man, I tell you, uh, leading up to this show, I was super excited because I love having uh, Steve and Rhett on because usually we can just watch and listen to Jamie talk the whole show. Um, also, I'm super <laughs> jealous if you guys can't tell, I'm wearing my Nintendo hat, and that's because I don't have the hat that uh, Steve promised me. Neither do I. In the mail, both of them. It, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. Oh, it's a check. Yeah, last night. Checks in the mail. It might be I water. Guess, I, guess, I guess we know who the favorite is. Yep. Chuck is. In the center. Yeah. It's messed up. <laughs> it's messed up, guys. I think Scott's got one, too. Maybe not. I might be lying about that. I would have it on. Scott sponsored. I have one. I have one in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an eighth on shirt. I should have worn that for the. I show. do have an eighth on shirt. It's a little tight on me now. I need to lose a few pounds. <laughs> that, uh, it's that twenty twenty poundage. I know, dude. Twenty twenty pounds killed me, man. Holy crap. Uh, well, we're going to talk a lot about your books and, of course, the the publishing and kind of how you guys have uh, taken it by storm last year and going into this year. Um, we had Red on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about some of that, um, and um, I want to kind of dive deeper a little bit into what you guys are doing with Athon this year and goals and stuff like that. Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk about uh, what we've been up to this week, and Chuck gets to go first today. Oh, same old, same old, man. Uh, taking care of the kids, softball, theater, closing in on the end of Jack Dark Book 2. Uh, actually started playing around with some of the first parts of Jack Dark Book 3 uh, when I hit a stump the other day. Nice. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just writing and taking care of the family, man. That's what it's doing. Daughter's back in softball tournaments, and the kid uh, one of his plays wrapped and he's got two more that he's involved in so i'm i'm bouncing between softball fields theater and my desk and trying to feed everybody in between so <laughs> that's that's pretty much my life i hear you brother scott what about you oh i know you're gonna ask me to ask i don't have much writing a lot um working on edits for uh, let's see, I'm working on edits for Departure Day, which actually I put up on pre-order for March 7th, finally. So only like five months between books, you know, perfectly as planned. Um, but, and then, so it'll be the fourth and final book in that series. I'm working on edits for Orphan Wars 1, working on um, Blue Sun Armada, which is my years and years long passion project that I kind of do whenever I feel like I just want to have fun. And um, that's not much navigating work. A lot of people leaving the department uh, in the next spring here. Big fear of a big lieutenant sh uh, shakeup, which never actually happens, but everybody's always afraid of it. Hey, maybe you could go to first. I'm not sure that'd be a good idea. <laughs> maybe first shift makes me tired because I like when I had to go to training, I had to come in earlier and I drive during normal daytime hours. I'm like, why are all these people in cars driving around, being in front of me, being all around, <laughs> being people on the road? Or, it's yeah. a. You know, I remember going from uh, third shift to CP, and uh, you know, at night uh, after 10 p.m., the roads are pretty much dead. So if you've got to go anywhere in a hurry, I mean, I can remember going across one of the streets, Pawnee, and there's nobody on it. I'm going to an officer in trouble. I'm going like 90 across the street because there's nobody on the street. But you do that during the day, and there's like 100 cars you have to navigate, and you yeah. can only go like 35 because you're weaving in and out. Yeah. It's just not fun. It's not fun. At night, you can just drive around, think deep thoughts, <laughs> listen to an audio book maybe until somebody gets shot in the face, and then you go to that. True. Most of the time, you just – anyway. But so that's about it for me, you know, 
just kind of grinding out, trying to trying to keep my word counts up, trying to keep consistent. Uh, 2021, I'm trying to be very consistent with my output and my effort. Um, I'm trying to live a little bit more financially, minimally, because holy crap, I can spend money. So I'm trying to dial it back a little bit. Right on. I, I looked. So the, the story of that is I looked at vehicles and I wanted to get a Tahoe so I could take my family places, but the only one I could find was used and it cost more than my first house. And I'm yeah. like, I don't think I can ever buy a vehicle again. They're so expensive. Yeah. Unless you get a really good deal on it, man. It, oh, there's no good deal good enough. Yeah. I mean, a really good deal would be $40,000. That'd still be like almost as much as my first house. So I just can't do it. It's crazy the difference between cars and like SUVs and trucks. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's retarded. Like I, I, when I was shopping for a truck, I'm like, ah, oh, 30 grand ain't bad. But then when I'm shopping for a car, I'm like, 15 grand's really good. And well, you get all the bells and whistles. It's it's marketed. Trucks are marketed to middle aged men who are in the higher income earning things. And are you so, a truck, that I'm middle aged, Scott. Well, you 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 could be if you try real hard. <laughs> but um, but like seriously, when I was growing up, the trucks were cheap because you used them to throw wood and shit in. Right. But now right. they're status symbols, and they're for people who have the most money in our society, and that's why trucks cost more than Mercedes and Corvettes now. Yeah, I can see that. Anyway, but anyway, that's it. What what are you guys doing? Uh, let's see. I'll uh, I'll let Rhett. You want to go next? I kind of I don't want to jump in front of the guests. You guys want to go first about what you've been up to this week? What we're doing? Yeah, like what have you been up to the last what week? Are you, you doing any, any good writing projects? Read a good book? Watch a good TV show or whatever? Um, what did we just watch? We watched Fargo season four, which was pretty good. I love that show. Nice. Uh, last week we we've, we've been on prepping. 2021 releases kick for like a month. It's been pretty crazy, but yeah, I think we're all all set up now. So hopefully we could do some other stuff. But yeah, that's been a ton of work. Not a lot of solo writing then for you. No. Uh, what about you, Steve? What have you been up to, man? Writing. That's funny. That's so <laughs> cute. That's so 2020, <laughs> right? Um, well, so here we go. I, I'm going to share my screen for a second. Okay. Uh, this is going to be his hat orders he's sending out. Dude. No, no, but no, but I do. I can send you that tracking if you want. Oh, yeah. So this was my week. Uh, oh, no. Nice. Uh, you, you had the best week of all of us. That's a good week. Thank we uh, We ended up getting a new dog. Her name is Luna, which I think you might be able to figure out where that name might have come from. Um, the coyote is no short of crises with yeah, uh, the Luna Missile Crisis. Um, Scott, I swear this is a coyote. Um, like a coyote. <laughs> so we, the, the, the very like condensed version is we found it on one of the adoption sites, right? And like this dude with some sketchy van shows up and there's like cages in the back of his van. He's like, this is the dog, right? And and we're like, well, what's her name? He's like, well, she's only had a name for like a day, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and then he just drove away and left the dog at our house. We didn't fill out papers. We didn't like pay money. Uh, we we just we just have a dog at our house. So of course now we filled out application stuff, but I've never experienced anything like that where you just <laughs> get a dog. So did you go around your neighborhood looking for lost dog flyers? No, no. Uh, that dog. <laughs> I'm convinced that they were just driving along and saw a coyote on the side of the road and went, you know, and the dog jumped in the back. And now I've got a, a wild dog in my house. Um, <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But she's, she's been really good. She's been, I mean, she's just got a lot of energy. So between that and uh, my car broke down in Oklahoma, which is the worst place your car can break down. Um, ever is is just middle of Oklahoma. So now I have no car. Uh, The engine blew up an hour and a half away from my house. And so I've kind of spent the last week dealing with recall issues and um, just really honestly, just super stressed out. I'm a very like even keel guy. When I get stressed out, it's no fun at all. So, but new week. And, uh, and like Rhett said, we've been working on, on scheduling the first half of 2021 as far as Athon Books uh, releases go. Uh, amongst those is Josh Hayes' box set for the Valor series. So nice. very yeah. excited uh, to be able to release I don't know that I've ever box been so excited to get a box set cover. 
like you showed me the image. I was like, that's actually really cool. I like that. Yep. So we got that. Uh, we talked to Scott Moon about maybe doing a new trilogy, and I'm excited about that. And uh, of course, wait, wait, you gave him another project to do. Uh, yeah. Well, no, he I, gave, well, technically, he gave it to us. Yeah. Oh. Technically, he gave it. To us. <laughs> I'm gonna pitch. I'm gonna pitch something. <laughs> and then yeah, we got uh, C. Stephen Manley's uh, Dark trilogy, hopefully coming out. I'm hoping that we hit this by the end of the year. There's no pressure on you there at all, but that would be great to have the full Listen. trilogy. Uh, you guys have been so fucking patient with me and all of this crap. I mean, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I have had so many deadlines blow past me. <laughs> We're good. We're good. I mean, uh, I'll release now. I mean, that's why we wait, right? Like as a book publishing company, that's why we wait until there's three books so that we're not rushing you. There's no reason to rush, right? We're, we're not... We're not writing the Bible. We're, we're writing John, Jack Dark. You know, it's, it can come out whenever we want. It's a great book. Yeah, I appreciate it. I've been when he said no I pressure, I had that, 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 uh, that clip from Ace Ventura when he's like, you don't know the first thing about pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I think my wife's actually putting more pressure on me than, than you guys because she wants to read the next one because she really liked the first one. Must be nice to have a wife that reads your books. <laughs> oh, no. No. Not, nothing goes out the door that she doesn't read first. My wife has been reading the Buried Goddess Saga since we released it. She's on book three finally, which um, <laughs> out of six. So right, we released that, what, like February of 28, 2019, and she's finally on that book. That's oh, dude, good. I've got you beat, man. I, the first thing I ever wrote, I published back in like 2011 or 2012, and I printed out a signed copy and wrote a little note to her, and she keeps it in her nightstand. The thing's only like this thick. Never read it. <laughs> she 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 got to the dedication and she was like, oh. But your, <laughs> your, yeah, but your wife is really used to things that are only about that thick, right? Uh, uh, oh, bam. That's hard. I don't know. I think show's over. I think I pretty much know we can do. <laughs> that, that wraps it up. See well, I mean, we, can, we can continue okay. with that. <laughs> it's a good show. So. My... My uh, my wife actually doesn't read my books at all. She read the first couple, and we just talked about it. And she's like, you know what? I don't think I want to do that because it's a lot of pressure, mm. you know, on her. Because she doesn't like it, and then you know how touchy writers can be. And and she just decided she wasn't going to, and so she doesn't. And I don't. And that mm. actually puts me up. I don't have to write anything that I might feel she might be embarrassed about or or shocked by because that could happen in my writing. And who would want their wives to be touchy? Mm-hmm. anymore they're not oh. that's a lie let's see what have i been up to this week um nobody I, asked yeah, <laughs> yeah but I uh i've actually done a lot i've kicked it right back into gear uh for writing and i've done a lot of work on multiple projects which i'm really excited about um started tracking my words again after all the moving is done and i hit uh, about twenty thousand words for january which was not anywhere near my uh, written down goal, but it was still a lot for me, especially with moving during the whole month. Um, and I'm going to try to do um, I'm going to try to do ninety thousand in February. Now that I'm kind of on the the roll, I've uh, been doing a lot of writing journaling, which has helped me a lot. Like every day, kind of work um, writing down what I did the, the day before and my dear diary. Exactly. Uh, and, and I write in very small letters over and over. I hate Steve. I hate Steve. You're right. I hate I've, Steve. Seen, I've actually seen Josh's journal. It says, D- Dear Diary, day 47 with no hat from Athon. True. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if I can go on. <laughs> Life has lost all meaning. <laughs> I'm never writing a single word again until I get that hat. <laughs> so like a hunger strike, except a lot less. I wouldn't be surprised if it shows up today. I'm just oh, saying. If it does, I'll make I'll do an unboxing video. He was actually oh. driving it to your house when his car broke down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Funny story, I almost called Josh. I was in Oklahoma, which is what, like three hours, maybe two and a half hours away from where you were. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm like, who do, how do I get out of this situation? And, and like, I couldn't rent a car because I was out of state without a credit card. Uh, and so they wouldn't rent me a car. Um, and so I'm like, I, I, mean, I could call Josh and Josh can drive two and a half hours and then drive me back to, we figured it out. But still, I, I would have, that should have been a thing I did. I, I would have done it, but I would not have left your house without a hat. 
Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it still would have been at my house at that point, so that's yeah. fine. <laughs> you would have been five hundred. Totally worth it. Yeah, but no, the uh, the writing journal thing is helping me a lot. Um, and then obviously the the Kistro Rimo, which apparently there's some mess up. Jr. sent me a message this morning. There's some kind of algorithm mess up on the sheet, so I got to fix that today. But uh, I'll work on it. Uh, also, we're doing a survey for the group, uh, keystrokemedium.com slash survey. Uh, if you have participated in it, thank you very much. If you have not, I'm going to sweeten the pot a little bit because uh, we do have. A free coyote. <laughs> we have uh, right now we're giving away three of these copies. If you do the, oh, the nice. setup, it's a workbook by James S. Aaron. It's really cool. Uh, it, it If you're having any kind of trouble at all, you don't have to use the whole book. You can just go to the section that you're having problems with and you can write in it, fill it out. It's a kind of a workbook uh, for your novel. Those um, pages look like Joe Biden executive order. So those oh, are like yeah. No, they're blank. Yeah, yeah. They're definitely blank. They mean, <laughs> they mean absolutely nothing in context of uh, what you're doing. How much? Yeah, okay, uh, so there, there is stuff in it. Yeah, there's stuff in it. It's just, okay. uh, like some prompts and guides and structure. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're giving away three of these if you participate in the, uh, in the survey. But also I'm going to sweeten the pot because I got in the mail before my hat extra copies uh, extra keystroke copy mugs oh Ooh. who designed that logo uh steve steve did well i think jamie actually did, jamie did it. and steve, jamie just, takes, steve yeah. just takes credit for it yeah. uh it's a it's a really cool logo with uh, the coffee bean and keystroke coffee it's on every single one of our <laughs> six coffee blends that we have uh that you can get a whole bean now walt robillard but i have a cup Right here, it's sealed in the box, never been used, never been opened, or a mug, I should say. So I'm going to give that away. I'm going to give that away, too. If you participate in the survey, I think we'll leave it up for another couple of weeks, probably, uh, just to kind of gauge where our viewers and listeners are at, um, see where they, what kind of content they want us to do, what kind of comp content they like or don't like. Uh, it takes, like, I don't know, a minute to fill it out, uh, and you could win a mug. Just saying uh okay also right now i want everybody in the live this is your job for the show i want everybody in the live chat to go and subscribe to jeff haskell i'm putting the link in the chat jeff haskell's youtube uh channel tomorrow he is doing a 24-hour novel live uh stream where he's gonna start i think at 6 30 tomorrow morning i'm not i'm not really sure exactly on the time but he's going to stream for almost for 24 hours uh, and going he's he's going to try to finish a novel in that time. Well, the first draft, not the entire thing. Uh, and he needs seven more subscribers to get the hundred. You need to do a custom URL for your YouTube channel. So if you have not subscribed, go do that today. Knock him up to 100. I think he needs seven. He's at 93. Yep. So uh, if you haven't subscribed, please go do so and support him. And then uh, hop in with him tomorrow while he's doing that and kind of give him some encouragement. He's got some keystroke coffee uh, to keep him fueled. Uh, and also, if you want some writer fuel, go to keystrokemedium.com slash keystroke coffee and get your own coffee. I'm <clears throat> just saying, self-plug. Okay. Uh, let's talk about what do you guys want to talk about first? Athon or collaboration? I'll give you guys the choice. I want you to choose. Okay, I'll choose. Uh, yeah. let's do collaboration. <laughs> Classic Brett Bruno, right? There. Yeah, yeah. You, you do the talking, and then we'll do. Uh, so I'm, I'm. You guys have done some really massive collaborations in the last year. You mentioned Burry Goddess Saga, which is like, what, over a million words of uh, epic fantasy goodness. Uh, I finished listening to the – I'm kind of in, in, in Robin's category where I just finished listening to the first book, but whatever. It's, it's, it's good. You should go listen Here's to worth of audio book listening. It's awesome. Deal. That's true. Uh, and you've done The Luna Missile Crisis, which has been blowing up on uh, audible plus right and then dead acre it's not on audible plus it's just no, audio dead acres dead acres on audio plus. plus dead acre is like over what three thousand ratings yep. which is phenomenal nice. um, good ratings. i mean that's good on any book but you're talking about a novella 
Um, and it's killing it, man. Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, let's talk about your, how you guys work together. Um, and let's use uh, Data Acre specifically this time around since uh, that's the latest <coughs> you've worked. Oh, oh. Sorry. Sorry. He's got props. I do have props. Uh, so, so let me start. We never, ever, ever talk about this, but Rhett and I wrote a book together. Oh, just, I bought that book. When I yeah. We, it, now, listen, this is as thick as Josh's <clears throat> uh, first book. Um, so it's not like it's, it's not very long, uh, but, but Rhett and I decided early on after we finished the Buried Goddess Saga, we'd actually, we'd no, finished Luna Missile Crisis before we finished like the Buried Goddess Saga. What's that? There's only like three books of it, I think. What, Buried Goddess? Yeah. Okay, so we had finished three books of Barry Goddess. We'd also written Luna Missile Crisis together. And we're like, we've done this with four books now, uh, going on five or, you know, whatever. And, um, and we decided that we would put together this, uh, this little book called Two Authors, One Book. Um, yeah. Yes, if you might get, yeah, you might get that reference. Um, we also interviewed several other authors, including Richard Fox and Josh Hayes, mm -hmm. who has two paragraphs here in the back. Um, we have uh, Terry Mixon and Glenn Stewart. We have Felix R. Savage and Bill Patterson, uh, Michael Anderley and Paul Middleton. Like we we interviewed a bunch of guys. I think we also interviewed Jason and Nick with uh, the Galaxy's Edge group. And we kind of asked the questions, you know, how do you collaborate together? And then throughout this book, we gave our our way of doing it. Um, and not even like this is why our way is superior, but this is why our way works for us because for collaborating um, authors. It, it's all about what gives you the best experience and uh, produce the best words. So uh, that's a plug. I mean, you don't need to buy the book probably because we're going to tell you everything that is in the book uh, right here, but um, it is available on Amazon. So uh, you can go do that. Rhett, did you want to say anything? I like the totally term co-writing murder for free. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is right. So it's two, it's two authors, one book. Uh, co-writing murder free. Yeah. Yeah. So we wrote that we wanted to kill each other. <laughs> it was so <laughs> Initially I was like, and you guys are both still friends after like two million words of writing together. We so very somehow, somehow made it work. Yeah. Um, I think very got us like it probably broke us a little bit, but <laughs> that was just a ton of work. Um a lot different than Dead Acre or Luna Missile Crisis as far as, as writing together. As if anyone that's written epic fantasy knows, there was just a lot of characters to balance with two people. Yeah, definitely a lot of back and forth with um, uh, Rhett and I just have a Facebook chat open all day long, especially when we're writing books together. And it's just constant back and forth with questions about should we do this? Should we not do this? Um, our, our particular process is that he and I each kind of take characters. And then like I wrote Whitney, he wrote Torsten. And, uh, and then, you know, you could split up the other like six POVs, however you want, because um, that's what we did as well. And then we just kind of switch after we're done with a chapter two or three or whatever. We give each other our chapters. We write into it. We edit into it. Um, we like to say that we each wrote 50 percent, but we touched 100 um, percent. So that's kind yeah, of how. Both not outliners, so we don't do like the dense outline that one person writes it out and then we work through it. We kind of just talk through where we wanted to go, both write separate parts and then swap back and forth, see what worked, what didn't, um, if we have to rewrite anything. And we could, we could talk about what, what do we call that point? Uh, so Brett has a, Brett has a, a mental breakdown moment in every book that we write <laughs> because I, I will write like 30,000 words and then Rhett will go, this doesn't work. And then he'll start rewriting it and then he'll have a mental breakdown and he'll go, no, you rewrite it and then I'll rewrite it and then it'll work. But if there's every single book we write, there's, there's just a moment. There's a point where we pushed an idea too far and it just doesn't work with the rest of the story. And we keep trying to like, adjust things and fix it. And then we reach that point where it's just like, no, let's just like start from the top 
and, yeah. and make it work from the top instead of trying to do this crazy surgery. And that always guys, happens every time. Do you guys take the book kind of in sections? It's like you, you start talking about the overall – uh, you have a meeting about that. I know you you talk back and forth every day, but when you when you talk about concept for the book, you have a a, a first meeting where you're like, this is what we want to do for the book. And then while you're writing, do you talk about beginning, middle, end, or Jamie's shaking his head? Um, we uh, it depends on, on the story. Like Buried Goddess, we knew what the end of the <laughs> book arc was going to be, and everything in between was kind of us as we go. Dead Acre was a little different. It was only what thirty thousand words, so I think. Steve did the first half, I did the second half, and then we brought it together and then sort of rewrote it from the beginning with what we had brought together. Yeah, so there was no outline. You you just wrote the beginning and the end and split that and then basically meshed them together. Wow. Sort of talked through where we want the end to wind up. Yeah. Like that one was a mystery. So we had the answer. Right. We sort of just talked through it, what would lead to that and and brought it together. But yeah, we don't do dense outlines at all, really. No written outline, more of just planning sessions and constant go give and yeah, take. Yeah, calls. And if we reach a point where we're like, I don't know where to go, well, then that usually ends up in like a two or three hour phone call talking about all the different ideas for where the chapters should go. Um, especially Barry Goddess Saga, that happened a lot because we would both basically start by writing act one, each of our certain characters. And then we would stop at like 50,000 words because those were 200,000 word books and plan from there. Interesting. So I'm curious in those books from, I'm sorry, you're going to. I was going to say, I'm curious if you guys would recommend this for other people, this type of method, because a lot of collaborators do work from some sort of outline that's written. But so do you recommend it or what advice would you give to collaborators? I would say a lot of people are co-writing because they write, they can produce faster that way, right? Or they're, they're co-writing for a famous author so they can produce faster and sell with that name, stuff like that. And if you're going for speed, don't do it our way. Writing our way takes just as long, if not longer than me writing a book alone, but we like super perfect the book. Um, mm -hmm. It's not gonna be a style where you can pump out books fast and generate income by sort of being able to pump out books fast because you have two people working on the same thing. I mean, we're going back over this like a hundred times back and forth to make these these stories work um, and basically sound like it's by one person instead of two people so it's almost like a compounded dev edit from the beginning like somebody works it and then you go back and dev edit it again and then go back and dev edit it again until you get it right well we um <clears throat> what's what's fun about the way that we do it is that it, it always feels like you're you're reading a book as well as writing a book so like i'll know sort of what what rhett's arc is going to be because we've talked it through, but then I get to read it and write into it and discover sort of how, how, how he made it work. And I'm sure it's the same thing for him. Um, so it's, it becomes fun. The benefit Rhett and I have is that we literally, I mean, we run eighth on books together. Yeah. Um, we write books together. Now Rhett is sort of a, um, I mean, I'll, I'll always say this, Rhett's a better writer than me. So Rhett has done a lot of individual books that I, I have not gotten any of my individual books out at this point. Um, because I, I know that's my that's my problem is I, I write like like 10 things at a time and I don't really care about finishing my books. Um, that's what actually the benefit working with Rhett or with a co-writer is for me personally is like it forces me to finish a book. I just love writing. And so I'll write like Dead Acre for me. I just wrote 10,000 words one day and and I went, oh, that was fun. And then <laughs> <laughs> and then we kind of rewrote the whole thing based on that Western premise and took the kind of found what the great idea in there was and we'll distill it back. And that's why I like working with Steve because I struggle to actually start the books because I can't write anything unless I really love it. Yeah. Um, so then Steve- and That's all I want to do. I just want to start books. Steve will write like 10 different 10,000 word samples. And there's been a number of things that we've gone through and been like, there's no way we can really take this and we'll just scrap it. He doesn't care at all. So, so that's the cool thing. Like Dead Acre, we both were reading, and it, and what he had was cool. But then we were like, oh, like this needs to be more Dresden Files slash The Witcher. Like that was our goal to make those things set in the West. And so we rewrote it that way. And that one's an interesting co-write because it's first person. So it, we don't get that benefit of one person taking an arc, someone oh, else right. 
arc. Yeah. We sort of both took story arcs because that book's basically a one half, second half book. And even when we do an, a novel version, we'll probably do that, break it up by like act one, act two, and, and do it that way. Because it is first person. That's a little a little different than being able to each take like three main characters in another yeah. fantasy. A lot, of, a lot of collaborators do that where they kind of have their own character. They have primacy over mm. and stuff. So I'm also interested, um, you said, talked about writing a book, but then completely starting from scrap. And I think that's that can all oftentimes be uh the best course I'm trying to f i've done that before where i tried to fix the same book for like 10 years and usually where i finally broke through is where i just started writing on a fresh page but you still have all that book you wrote in your you know it's back there and it, it informs the new stuff so i'm curious about that project process and kind of fascinated by it i can see josh is like dying over there because he can't he's still he's still on sentence one no outline yeah, <laughs> oh, what? All, he heard, all he heard after that was blah 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 blah. No outline. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we ever throw away like an entire book and and start over. But what we do is, you know, say we're at sixty five thousand words of this book, um, mm -hmm. we will realize that we have been dicking around with like four thousand words just to make it all work. Mm -hmm. When all we really needed to do was go back to the start, change a few things that would ultimately make those four thousand words work better and so it's it's almost like a deep read through that we'll do from the start to figure out where we need to adjust certain things to make us be able to move forward and i think that that's something you can't achieve as an author who's trying to write so fast just to pump out books it's very difficult to go i need to stop writing go back and read to figure this out because you know a lot of authors they, they they write their first draft they publish their first draft um and and i mean it took us two and a half years, I think, to write the Buried Goddess Saga. Um, and that that's interesting to, point to, to make because you, you guys have been putting out a lot of material, but a lot of this stuff was started, you know, maybe not even in 2020, but like 2019, where like, how, yeah. how long ago was it when you wrote that Weird West 10,000 words? That one we wrote right before it came out. That was, uh, the 10,000 oh, really? words was like, what, like a year ago, probably? So do yeah, you that's remember... What I mean. Yeah. So do you remember when the collective, uh, by the way, I mean, that sounds so like sketchy, but we have, we have, a, <laughs> we have a chat that's called the collective where it's just a bunch of authors that kind of talk around or whatever. And, um, we started a thing that was, uh, where Scott made an Excel sheet to keep daily. Oh, numbers. Yeah, I think yeah. that's where keystroke Rymo or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. That's where it came from. Right. Yeah, yeah we, we had a word count thing initially in our in our writer sprinter group stuff. Yeah, and that would have been like October, November of 2018, and that's when one day I went, "I'm gonna write a weird western," and I went, blah, 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 blah. and then I put it away for like a year and a half, and I went, "Rat, read this, see what you think about it." And he's like, "It's got a really cool premise, but there's no story," and I'm like, "That's because there's no story. I just wanted to write about this character. I love characters. I don't care about story." I think I remember seeing that on the spreadsheet going, holy shit, is he going to write 10,000 words every day? <laughs> I did that one. And then the, the very next day I did something called did like uh, 11,000 words the next day. If I, I did 12,000 on something called the secret King, um, which is still only about a 20,000. And then I did 8,000 words on that the next day. And then I just stopped writing for a Yeah, That was one where we like worked through the whole thing and we still haven't found the answer for it. And maybe one day we will. So, and like two holes is that we spent like what like a month reworking that and just still didn't find the answer and i wrote a comedy vampire thing like right after that as well which so they're like rhett said i'll write like and it, and it I, I don't want it to seem like it takes away from rhett in any way that i write a bunch of ten thousand word things and then we all work because rhett really makes them work i just like writing new characters and that's my fun i i just go here's chapter one it's it's four thousand words do you like it what, what I kind of what I was getting to about the, the complete revision thing is not so much to scrap everything, but I think that sometimes stories need to like germinate and a lot of writers have been writing their whole lives. They have, you know, I have a disc full of started stories going back to when I had a print on a dot matrix and some of those stories come back and some of them don't, but sometimes they just mature kind of in your subconscious. And then especially if you get a co-writer that can bring kind of some new life to it or some different angles, then I think it's a, it's not the only way to get a really great story, but I think it is a very good way sometimes. I went back and looked. Uh, I found the spreadsheet in March oh. of 
March of 2019 is when you wrote. I mean, there's a 11,000 word day. There's a 9,500 9, word day, a 9,900 word day, like just slamming it out for like a week. And then nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it goes in phases. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. I have like a folder of like six short stories. I wrote all of them in like three months, and then I haven't written a short story since. Well, this was uh, this was a one day eighteen thousand word book. Like literally, I wrote. I, think, I wrote like nine thousand. You wrote nine thousand, and we went. It's done. That's insane. Yeah, and I, I think it can depend on the book, right? Like like Scott said, some books need that time to germinate. I think if you're going to do a real complex, maybe character-focused story, it needs that. If you're going to do a, a plot-focused type of story that is a simple story uh, or something, then, yeah, you you might not need that time to germinate. But, like, me and Steve never rush anything out. I'm publishing a book in April that I started writing, like, four years ago. And it took almost four years to actually get it where I wanted. So yeah, yep. we don't really. We kind of will sit on things waiting. Luna Missile Crisis was the same way. We waited like two or I probably like two years for the deal we wanted for that, which was an audio focused thing with Ray Porter. I've got a middle grade book that I wrote, Nano Rimo, twenty sixteen, and it's done. Just never did anything with it because uh, who the hell knows how to publish a middle grade book. So I, I would love to know that. Yeah, my advice is don't even bother. Right. <laughs> so we're just we're, so we're waiting. And you know what? It's it's a one draft fifty thousand word nano thing that I'm going to hand over to Rhett, and he's going to literally double that story, and then we'll just sell it as something that works for us. So yeah, yeah. That's just me. I don't like going back over stuff, and and that makes me a horrible writer. But I'm in a position with Athon where I don't really have to worry about that that much. I'm just right. it's just fun. If you have co-writers and a team and stuff like that, you know. Well, what I th what I really think is interesting is your guys, not your publishing model for your company, but your your publishing model, your book writing model for you you two, is very different from the very indie centric. Let's pump out a book every month and uh, just do it, slam it as hard as you can, and don't look back and just kind of push a book and push a book and push a book, which I think speaks to the reception of your books because they have been received so well. I mean, Luna Missile Crisis and Dead Acre. I mean, Dead Acre was number one on the audio store, wasn't it? Audible.com. Uh, it was number one for, yeah. But the reason I pump out books is because I am really impatient to get to the next, like, like Steve, I have all these stories I started, but I'm different. Every story I start, I have to finish. And so like, I have like 300 books I want to write. And so I have to crank through the books to, cause I, I, I get so passionate about multiple stories and you can only write a book. So even a fast book taking a month, I mean, I literally have hundreds of half or partially started books in my file and I want to finish them all. And so that's the main reason I push so hard and so fast, but I also like writing fast. I feel like the ideas come quicker if I churn through it, but then I'll spend a lot of time on ed editing and revision. And like when I, like what you're talking about, I will go, when I get to a point where I'm not confident in the story, then I will go back and read from the beginning. And that's when I really have to put in a lot of hours to get something done on time is because I'll be, you know, you get 75,000 words into a book and I have to read from the beginning, like every two or three days to know where I'm going to write in 80 to 90,000 parts of that book. And so it gets to be pretty fatiguing towards the end. That's why by the time I get done with the book, I've probably read it 30 times and I'm just done with it. Well, yeah. You I, know? I think part of what we bring to the table as Athon is, is that flexible? Like Josh said, we, me and Steve ourselves don't really follow the indie model of, of what works now, which is kind of being able to pump books out faster, but we'll publish authors like that. We'll publish authors that are slower. We, are flexible enough to try all sorts of different things mm -hmm. because it really comes down to what the author is capable of. If you're going to force them to do stuff, some authors like the best thing we bring to the table is we slow them down. And because yeah. they're fine with us, they can't just publish the book as soon as it's done. We're able to slow them down and plan it for them so they can just move on and not worry about it. Um, Cause there are a lot of people that when it's finished, they just want to put it up so people can read it. But maybe that's not the best idea. And the best idea is to wait for the for the right deals to come around the right time. Well, I mean, if you finish your book in December, 
and your series is going to start like Christmas. Like that's don't do that, right? Like like a, you have to sort of think through the process of when the best time to publish the series is going to be, especially the genre, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, Chuck, we were talking earlier about his Jack Dark series. Um, that, that's kind of like a prime example of, of what we like to do for Athon. Yeah, we're going to we're going to publish those books quickly, but you don't need to write them quickly. Uh, I would much rather you put out a phenomenal series that you're very proud of that we that we stack up three books and then release them, then release book one and then go, oh, by the way, your pre-order is set for next month. Because <laughs> yeah. we have to, we, we aren't Random House, right? We can't release a series one book every year because it's just not how the digital markets respond. Yeah. And I can say from personal, <laughs> personal experience, it's better to do it the way that Steve's doing it. Uh, you guys are talking about doing it uh, because I've, I've seen it in, in the Valor series where we didn't wait and you guys told me to wait and I didn't want to. And then, yeah, you can and see, you can that see the, even the, the drop off. Just, off yeah. Right. That's the number that you really see. Yeah. And we, we, I mean, we have, some series where that number is huge for reasons that weren't the author's fault. Um, well, let's think about just in general how we do life, right? Like I am, re I am on uh, season five of The Magicians right now. Now I get that season five just hit Netflix. Okay, so there's there's that. But I just did season four. Season four has been on Netflix for what, like six months, mm -hmm. right? I watched season one three years ago or whatever and i'm finally at season four so I and, but i've watched 50 things between now and then and i think that that's how it is with books it's not that valor 2 wasn't a good book it's just that all your readers went on to 30 other series right and that's the reason the month like for the magicians if if there wasn't a netflix that was powerful enough to put that show on the front page when the new season was added probably steve would have forgotten about it for never would have watched it and the benefit of Netflix is there's just not as much stuff as on the Kindle store. And obviously the more popular shows they're gonna push. But how many shows are probably on Netflix that got a season two and no one has any idea because they already moved on to three more things. I had a guy on my feed yesterday or three days ago that said, um, nobody told me Stranger Things uh, season three came out. And like, that was what, like October? Last year or something? Yeah, right, whatever, whatever, years whatever it was, even, even more than that. And of course, I made the joke was that somebody's job to tell you that. It was. <laughs> but, <I can't> but, <laughs> but I mean, even something as popular as Stranger Things, there's people that loved season one and two and didn't even know season three hit. Yeah. yeah. So it's it, with books, it's even it's even less. Like your book comes out and it's popular for literally like four minutes. There's like a four minute period before a hundred thousand other books come out. Yep. Yeah, there's a book by Joe, Joe Solari I've talked about a lot on the show, but he has an interesting way of conceptualizing exactly what you're talking about. He talks about, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase and kind of butcher some of the terminology, but he says, your book, there's not really a cliff. Your book, when it's launched, it has an artificial buoyancy. And its natural place is down here, but since it's new, it's up here. Well, it only floats for so long and it starts to sink That's right. out of the visibility. That's very good. Yeah. It's much, that's a much better analogy than the cliff because yeah. it's right. Like you launch your pre-order at like 400,000 rank and then we release the book and it just rises to the top and our whole, like Rhett and I, most of our conversation is, is it going to stick? Is it going to stick? Yeah. Because we can throw as much money and we, we market the crap out of every book that comes out. I mean, we spend a ton of money on every book. There's no favorites. Um, but, but Amazon plays the algorithm game. And so we put all the money that we can into it and we go, is it going to stick? Is it going to stick? If it sticks, we put more money into it. If it falls, we put some money into it. And if it disappears forever, we go, okay, we need to figure out how, how to bring this to life. A new, a new approach, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw a Kalytics um, seminar that a free one that I, I don't normally follow, but I popped in and looked at it. And um, in, t in October 2017, there was something like 3,800 books a day getting published. Exactly. And, and so <laughs> you can put that. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, 3,800 a day. And so people talk about the 30-day cliff, but the 30-day cliff, it would be great to get a 30-day cliff because some people got like a two-day cliff. If right. You put a book out there that's got no traction and you don't have a fan base built up, you know, you'll sell like 10 copies and never sell another one again if you don't have some type of – and that's why I like to go with people who know how to do marketing to do that stuff because I'm not and good at it. And I think the mistake a lot of people do is they'll look at 
the outliers for how it sh they think it should be. Like yeah, right. and oh, all yeah, the right. stuff we're talking about. Okay, look at the Babaverse, right? Book four just came out like what three years later, and it was number one on Audible and all this this shit. But you can't look at that as an example no. of how most people will be when things go viral like that. It's just that doesn't generalize at all. A total, total different game, right? Like if I released a book six and we released book seven in Barry Goddess Saga right now and did nothing for it, like he did nothing because authors like that don't have to do anything, no one would read it. Yeah. And no one would read it at all. Like it, it would just sell a handful of copies that whatever Amazon could organically show it to people and then fall off a cliff. So that's not anything like what those authors are experiencing. <laughs> 1.4 million books a year at the number you claimed Kalytics had. Yeah, wow. that's just what they use. I, and before that, it was like 17 or 1800, and they've been throwing that number around for years. That the 17, 15 or 1600 a day is what I remember, like in 2016 or 2015. And and I think what a lot of this talks to is that if you do get some fans, even if it's a small fan base, it's more you'd be better spent keeping those fans happy. Then going out and looking for new ones, you know, keep them in in touch with with your series, and develop your core fan group. And I think if you look at people who are mega successful as indies, you'll find all of them have a very engaged fan group. So what about on on Athon's publishing level uh, go, for this year? I know you guys are doing a lot of work setting up publishing schedules and all that other stuff for 2021. Um, for authors that maybe are looking to come and uh, check out Athon or submitting to Athon, um, what are the what are the kind of things that you're looking for? Are you looking for anything specific or particular, or do you have any tips for authors that are trying to look to get um, published through Athon? Um, well, like always, <laughs> I wish I had a cricket nice. button. Wait for it. <laughs> like always, we're looking for the genres that sell, right? Um, everything else is going to be a sort of a passion project that we're going to push. And we've done those really successfully, but the genres that sell really well right now, we push a lot, space opera, military sci-fi, lit RPG. Um, what we actually could probably use a more epic fantasy. Um, we tend to prefer epic fantasy with a little bit of younger characters. So you can spin it young adult a little bit and you don't have to only compete with the Game of Thrones and the King Killer Chronicles and The Witcher and all those things that yeah. basically right. constantly own the charts. Right. Um, so those are the main things we're always looking at. Uh, we always keep our submissions open though. I, that's how we got a celebrity randomly submitted. So we would never close those. And yeah, we've tried projects that fall outside those main genres that are selling well for indies really successfully. Um, Salvage Crew comes to mind at the end of last year. That did really, really well. So yeah, just kind of follow our submissions protocol on our website. We, we look at 50 pages. We like a good pitch. And that's I, I always tell it. people with Keystroke, like if you put, um, if you have a submission, especially if it falls into military <clears throat> military sci-fi or, or, uh, or space opera, like just put that you heard us on Keystroke and what we'll do is bump that to the top of the, the slush pile. Um, right so, you, you know, make sure that you get read. That's something that we always do for keystroke folks. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, Red said we could use some more epic fantasy. The reality is we've talked about epic fantasy a lot. It's very, very hard to sell. This is coming from an epic fantasy author that did really well in the, in the genre. It's just really, really hard to sell. So we try to limit it to a few a year. Um, and also, like Red said, that it, it just it has to fall into that sort of young adult category. It doesn't have to be Hunger Games. It's just got to be, um, you know, it, we we probably are not going to be able to sell a series that has a, an eighty year old main character. Ha. Yeah, if you're going to do epic fantasy that doesn't feature younger, like again, there's this in the traditional world, young adult means a certain thing, right? It's Hunger Games, Divergent, in our world. Basically, as long as the characters in their lower, if there's a main character in their lower 20s or younger, it's young adult, right? If it's a 30 year old character that has never done anything in their life and is suddenly going on an adventure, it's probably young adult. It fits those tropes. And that's what we look for because, yeah, it helps you separate from the TV show books. Um, if it's going to be normal epic fantasy for adults, it probably needs to 
be more of that grim dark type of stuff. Joe um, Abercrombie, Steve. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it has to be more like that to at least give it a chance to rise in some of those. Everything know, Chuck hates about. <laughs> There's more obscure categories, right? I'm not a grim dark fan, that's for sure. If you publish an epic fantasy or sword and sorcery, which are like the two main ones, you're automatically below the top 20 because of seven Game of Thrones books. Right. All, the Harry, all the Harry Potters tend to be in the adult fantasy categories too. Which is Witcher, crazy. Um, Witcher, Robert Jordan, Tolkien. I mean, all the dead guys and then Patrick Rothfuss and George Martin, which I, I think he's still alive, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we don't know because he you know, he's been that's playing the, video games for the last six months. But that's the rumor. You start below those guys. Um, and that's not a great place to be. There's just a lot of trad competition over there. And there's a lot of indie authors who really control that market pretty it's well. Interesting. But, it's, yeah. it's interesting you say that because they're not only on the top, they're on the top by a huge margin. margin. Massive. Massive. And they're, and they're, they're, they're on the top like, selling at fourteen ninety nine too. Like it's yeah. And they're on the top on Audible, they never fall. And now the Hobbit's okay. up there, and there's three versions of the Hobbit. <laughs> you know, like that's so. Just- here's here's a broader question. Since we touched on the grim dark thing, and I'm not a fan of the grim dark thing, does the darker, more mature stuff sell better in general across genres than the more PG-13 stuff? No. I so I think if if you look at what what movies get the most viewers, it follows that pretty closely. Like, write a lighthearted Marvel type book, you'll probably be able to reach a wider fan base than something real dark and grim and serious. What what generally sucks in indie in indie in the indie realm is that like Mandalorian comes out and and then everyone writes their bounty hunter book. Right. And so the the market is inundated with um, don't take this term the wrong way but ripoffs. And and so everyone wants to do that and then they all just kind of wash out. Yeah. And and it's hard to really uh, pinpoint and then maybe one rises to the top. Right. And then but, more people want to write it because they saw the one at the top. And then they think, oh, shit, this is doing it. But they don't realize the 50 that failed and the one that made it. It's the one thing about indie that's different, right? Like in trad, they always say if you're trying to hit a trend, you're already too late. Right. Because you're going to be like a year or two out from releasing an indie. If you're a fast writer, like you, you could write that something next month. that trend in a month and release it. And but so is so are a lot of other people, and, and that's yeah. what Steve's saying. Like, it's the same with like lit RPG is a really hot genre. A year ago, it was a lot easier to sell than now because search lit RPG on Amazon, and there's thousands upon thousands. Yeah, and a lot didn't do well, and people don't see those though. They see the ones that really, really sold well, and think that's still a genre where you could just put a book up and it'll take off without any marketing or anything. Well, there's just not enough lit RPG harem books out. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at the covers. I mean, what's what's interesting is that we know the numbers of a lot of these things, and I'm not even just talking about um, Athon Books books, um, but like looking at the lit RPG genre, which is such a successful genre as a whole. I would say, um, Rhett, correct me if I'm wrong, but like 80 percent of the books that are released in that genre sell less than 50 books and then disappear. Probably, if my Google, if my searches on Amazon are to be trusted. And again, lit RPG is tough because there's no categories for it, so they're, everything's sort of spread all over the place. Hard to reach. Yeah, it. I mean, I would say like 99% of every book, of books in every genre that come out fail. You just don't see them. So <laughs> you guys did really well with Dead Acre and audio. What about the Weird West genre? Is that one? Is that kind of an untapped resource? Or that is... genre fascinates me. We yeah, we call it's ourselves an outlier. Right we, we absolutely call ourselves an outlier. As soon as Dead Acre released, I got no less than 10 texts from authors thinking that that meant they should write their passion weird Western mm-hmm. novel. And they're like, yeah, but you opened up the blah, blah, blah. We have, I mean, there's weird West authors that also have Roger Clark's narration who received zero benefit from him releasing a wildly successful uh, weird Western with us. Um, so for us, like that, it's absolutely an outlier. Uh, it's like the Bobbiverse, only nowhere near as successful as Bobbiverse. Like just because our weird Western did well, um, we consider 
a few things there. I think the cover really did it. I think that having Roger Clark really did it. I think that being an Audible original really did it. And I think that Rhett and my previous success as a writing author team together, um, all of those things came together at the right moment to create and, and, and it hit like at the beginning of Audible Plus, right? Like yeah, it was yeah. the, So is it ever going to happen again in that genre? I don't know. We, we sold the hell out of Haley Stone's Make Me No Grave. But then... 100%. I love that I, book. I think it's very interesting. And I think that anytime you put Western with something, it's dangerous. Because intuitively, it feels like that should make it a big hit. Right. But if you look at the amount, like I did Dark Landing. It was a sci-fi Western. I thought it would do really well and had a lot of support and should have had a good launch and it didn't do much and well, yeah. Averett liked it but I think that of all the genre crossovers people who read westerns are the least likely to jump to another genre and read a mix. And that's the thing you're writing those types yeah. of things with the genre fiction spin you've lost the actual western readers like yeah. Star Wars is a space western but you can't market it that way. Right. right? It's not only, only the hardcore fans who actually understand all these genres know that, oh, I'm watching a space western. But the 99% of casual fans that you're trying to reach, they're like, what the hell is a space western? What the like, look at look at Mandalorian, man. Every time Mando walks, you hear spurs. Did you ever notice that? Yeah, it, it's a western. It's his armor. But most people don't even realize they're watching a spaghetti western and yeah. love it. Yeah. I love the sound just because it reminds me of Spaghetti Western. Like exactly. The sound, and, the music and, and even just the the ambiance of the story. I love that. It's the trick they're playing on you with Star Wars, basically. Right. But look, we got to benefit off of Red Dead Redemption 2, right? Like, we marketed it to all the Red Dead Redemption 2 fans, and, and it's Arthur Morgan, right? So, like... We're also shameless, right? We're not... Like, you might find an author that gets Roger Morgan, but... They, or Arthur Morgan, they want to make sure that they sell their own book first. We were like, no, we don't care. You know, put him up front. And that makes him part of the brand and diminishes us a little. But that's how we were able to really grab his audience by actually marketing it in Red Dead Redemption groups and stuff like that. It's so another, another to part of the over to the genre. Another part of the collaboration. So let me ask you this. Um, so you talked about the danger of doing your market research and saying, look, this was successful, but not understanding that a lot of them weren't successful. So what is your advice to people? Should they be doing these deep dive research to find the hot genre or should they just write what they love and then try to find a place to it work it? It depends what their goal is. If their goal is to go full time and be an indie going full time where you basically have to write what, like eight books a year at, at the least, unless you get one of these viral hits and then you don't have to. Um, but yeah, then you're probably not making a good decision if you're going to write your passion weird Western at that moment, like save that for when your backlist and your income is so high, it doesn't matter. But if you want to make a full-time career writing indie where you need to actually pump out books like that to sort of start building your audience in a hyper competitive market, you got to write those hot genres. Um, well, and something else to really consider, and again, if we're talking to authors, I know that this is reading, writing, and everything in between, but like if, you're, if we're talking specifically to authors in this, recognize that like a lot of authors who go full-time end up having to go back to work because they'll release this wildly successful series and then release four more series after that that nobody buys. Um, you, have, you have to market each one, um, and that's just how it is. For most authors, and if you're, you have to exclude these huge, huge successes like John Scalzi and those guys who could write anything, right? Right. Anything they, they write, just put their name on the book. Their following is already built in. A lot of the big authors who broke into KU at the start of KU at, in 2014 who could write whatever they want. And you're like, how are they selling so much of every single different thing? And whereas most authors, they have, if they break out, they have one series that broke out, and then everything else sort of did well right and that's that's the model most authors are finding and that's you have to avoid looking at those super outliers like don't look at the super outliers don't look at the authors who didn't do any marketing at all and sold 10 copies like look at the don't people. look at drop trooper by rick partlow and expect your athon books military sci-fi series to do that we want every single one to do that but like drop trooper was wildly successful yes oh it's ridiculous 
Yeah. And still is ongoing. Yeah. It's, and that's, that's that sort of viral level you see where the book just keeps going and going and going and finding new people. Uh, and Rick's in the chat. Hi, Rick. Hi, hey, Rick. Well, nice I, work on Top Trooper, brother. And, and just the problem with that is it sets an expectation for, for the unicorn. Like I always call it the unicorn at the end of the rainbow in the field full of flowers and roses, right? Like this thing that doesn't exist in real life. Um, you set your expectation for that. And um, happiness is anytime you meet or exceed expectation. Everything else is disappointment. So if your expectation is here, you're just never going to be happy. It, but if your expectation is realistic, uh, your, your actually pretty successful book series, like that you were, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like you, you have to realize that your, your series is successful if, even if it doesn't hit viral success. Right. Yeah. And I, I think guys like, even guys like Dennis e. Taylor probably run into, run into that all the time, right? Like his Bible verse is huge and his next series will be huge, but not probably close to that huge. And well, I just look at uh, Ready Player Two. Like Re Ready Player One was huge and it defined a genre almost and it got movie deals and all that. But then Ready Player Two came out and it didn't really do anything. I mean, it, well, that's it's a little different because it's the same series and it is doing a lot. <laughs> so, but I mean, comparatively speaking, it's not. Or like, what about The Martian and whatever came after that? Artemis yeah, came after that. Like that. Yeah, Artemis, because same series, Ready Player Two. Ready Player Two is always going to get like fifty to sixty percent of the readers that Ready Player One got. Just yeah, fine. but it's still like number one in the sci-fi fantasy category, right? Yeah, like Artemis has like fifty thousand Audible ratings, right? Yeah, which is everyone would dream of that, and that's right. like a sixth of what The Martian had. Yeah, and money-wise, he's probably making like a sixth of what The Martian made, and he's probably sitting at home like, "Wow, this sucks." And that's just that's just True. sort of publishing, like to. J.K. Rowling has written more than just Harry Potter. All right. Who's read her other shit? Yeah, nobody. <laughs> Chuck has. One out of five uh, here, and we've all probably read Harry Potter. But, like, really, that Robert Robert Gallagher or whatever her pen name is, um, I, like, I don't want to read that. I didn't read Vacancy, which is literally her name. Yeah. And I and Harry Potter is my favorite thing of all time. If you could see the rest of my office, it's just all Harry Potter crap. Uh, but I don't want to read the same thing with stuff. all of, uh, like, George R. R. Martin's sci-fi stuff. Like I've never read any of his sci-fi stuff at all because I'm not interested in it. But it still did like crazy well, and that's where. Yeah, people, oh yeah, sure. I think get mixed up if they're looking at one thing at a time. So yeah. talking about expectations, like so, like a Josh expected to have this certain hat that came, <laughs> it never came, and then he would be sad. True. And so he would be unhappy. So happiness would be if he got a hat today in the mail. Oh, I'm excited. I think the mail is actually here. So I'm going to run out right after this is done and check. <laughs> live unboxing. Uh, everybody that listened to the live chat, uh, if you are a member on Audible uh, and you are the, a premium plus member, is that all it's available on or can you buy Dead Acre? You can buy it also. So here's the link to Dead Acre. Go and check it out right now. It's a 4.6 uh, star average with with over 3,000 ratings, and I can attest it's a phenomenal book. Uh, I think it's the my favorite thing of your writing uh, that I've read so Thank far. You. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought that I knew where it was going, uh, and then it got to the end. I'm like, oh, did not see that at all, and that was cool. Um, That's cooler and, here than the reviews that say they guessed it from page one. Yeah. Yeah. He's always going to say that. Well, I don't know that I, I don't know. I don't know that I necessarily believe those reviews because I you could go back and look at page one and, and there's I don't know that there's any way you could guess exactly how it's you just changed. literally guess randomly like you're playing the slot machine, maybe. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's totally extremely engrossing. It's one of those things that you just kind of it just sucks you all the way into the story, you know, and you can just yeah. Just the just the way that like make me no grave pulled you in with the prose and the dialogue. Um, the same thing happened here with Dead Acre. I I loved the, the way. You could, What's that? The fun of of writing Western is you could purple prose it, right? You could have. Yeah, that is fun. You have to do the rush through the content. Type right. Quick writing that that most genres require. You could just sort of spend that time describing a hill because yeah. that's what a Western is. It's it takes its time. I really loved it. Uh, I definitely recommend anybody to go and, and listen to it. It's a phenomenal audio book. Uh, Steve and Rhett, thank you guys so much for coming on. Thanks. Thanks for having us.
It's uh, it's always a good conversation with Stephen Rett and everybody that was in the live chat. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today on a Monday morning. If you're listening on the audio feed, we have a live show on Monday morning, 10 a.m. ish Central Time, which is actually coincidentally the only time uh, we don't talk about Eastern or Pacific standard, or Mountain Time. Standard, here. standard, standard, standard time, yeah. the time. <laughs> the only time also again is e stroke medium time in many circles oh yeah true um again if you would like to win a well you can't see it in the box i don't know why i picked the box up if you'd like to try to win a new keystroke coffee mug from keystroke medium go to keystrokemedium.com slash survey and take that survey uh put your email in there uh, you'll be entered to win both the book and the the mug um, and uh, we, we're looking for a crap ton of responses on that, and you can get a free mug. So, I mean, there's not really anything to lose. I'm going to do it right after we hang up. I mean, you definitely should. And, and give a scathing review. Uh, uh, don't forget to sign up for Haskell's uh, write-a-thon. Thing. No, that's true. It's, uh, it's, the link is in the chat. It'll be in the show notes. Kevin, uh, Kenneth Brits does a phenomenal job on the show notes. If you guys didn't know that, he listens to the show, puts in the timestamps for everything that we talked about and lists all of that in the show notes. Uh, and that allows you to go on YouTube and kind of click through the main points of the show that you want to listen to. Ken does a phenomenal job with that. Uh, make sure you tune in tomorrow for Walt Robillard and Coffee and Concepts. Mm -hmm. Um, marathon author, also, also with James S. Aaron, uh, will pr premiere another episode this week. He's actually on our pot bean list. He's the highest listened show so far this, uh, this last two weeks. So congrats on that, James. He's kicking everybody ass, uh, everybody else's asses. Thanks. Uh, and then the writer's journeys on Saturday, uh, they moved nights. I just finished listening to their latest show with Ryan Danks this morning, and it was a very motivational show. I, I love when people start talking about pushing content on multiple channels. Uh, so if you're interested in that, check out that show. Uh, everybody else, thank you guys for coming out and hanging out with us on uh, Monday morning. And come back next week. We're going to talk about some reading and writing and everything in between right here on Keystroke Media. Later, Woo. folks. Bye. Bye.